Hi. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, really excited to be talking to everybody. <clears throat> um, let's get started. So uh, before I go into my talk, I'm Ann Yortsoy. Yes, that's how it's pronounced. Um, I've been at Cargo since November of 2018, so fairly recent. Um, building a full UX team in practice. Yes, I am also hiring. Uh, before that, I was at Cisco Systems after an acquisition. Um, before that, I worked at startups, uh, various product companies, finance, advertising, independent consulting. And that's me. So enough about that. Let's talk about methodologies. Um, this is something that all designers run into. Uh, what's a methodology? Uh, methodology is simply a system that structures how work is done. Uh, engineers have methodologies, product managers have methodologies, and designers have methodologies. And sometimes these coexist all in the same space, space being a single organization. So there are a lot of methodologies. Um, there's Agile, there's on this screen, I did a, a search for various representations, visual representations of methodologies. Aren't there a lot of them? Aren't they pretty? Aren't they colorful? Um, <laughs> there's Agile. There's a few representations of Waterfall here. Um, there's something called MRD PRD, which is really old uh, and kind of elides into Waterfall, which means that's how you get bent Waterfall in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and then there's sort of design thinking at lower left. Um, and then there's, I'm not sure what that is at lower right, but it looks really expensive. I think it's from a consulting firm. <laughs> so why are there so many methodologies? Well, there's so many methodologies because making software is really painful. Um, it's complicated and it's expensive and it's stressful. And people really want that pain to go away. So methodologies are intended to solve for pain. Why is making software painful? Because um, it has to sell. It has to work. It has to be functional. There are lots of deadlines. Um, there are lots of necessary team communications. There are lots of necessary stakeholder communications. Communication is hard. Communication is 90% of design. <laughs> um, there's a lot of expectation managing. Uh, when is this going to be done? Why isn't it done sooner? Why is this so hard? Why do we need to hire more people? Um, changing priorities. Well, the market's doing this, so we should do this now. Oh, wait, when we started building this, the market wasn't doing that. So what does that mean in terms of what we're doing next? That's a really hard conversation. And there's never enough time or people. Uh, methodologies also cause pain. Tools can be used really badly. Um, tools can cause more admin overhead. Methodologies are tools. Tools can be used very, very badly. Culture is a really strong force at any organization. So when you apply a methodology, which is a tool, those tools get distorted. And they don't do what you think they're going to do. Sometimes they do bad things. Um, and the baseline culture of an organization, that culture's DNA, always wins over any methodology. It's pretty much a law. So design is already a process that we have to sell internally to our organizations. Um, things get really complicated when the org is learning a different process. Suddenly, there's way too much process. Because design is a process, now there's another one? Oh my god. Um, sometimes uh, methodologies are anti-design. Um, sometimes, because design is planning, Design is essentially a planning function. Engin engineering methodologies can be specifically anti-having that planning happen. Um, I'm sure we've all seen that. Um, methodologies might conflict with the design process. Uh, these methodologies might cause extra work, and it might block essential parts of the design process. So how do we fit it all together? Well, it turns out that we can fit it all together uh, by applying designer tools internally to our organization. We can turn empathy inward. Um, and we can ask, start asking some questions to try to get at what is the pain that's being solved for? Uh, what is it designed to eliminate? Whose pain is it? And how is the methodology failing? 
So let's go look at some methodologies and walk through some of this stuff. Uh, who here has heard of waterfall? Can I see some hands? All right, great. We're not always, we're not all past that yet. <laughs> all right, great. <laughs> all right, so pretty much everyone has experienced waterfall. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief history of waterfall because I think sometimes we lose sight of where it was working um, and why it exists. So waterfall is design, build, test, release. There is a um, big document at the beginning that lists all the stuff that has to be done. There's a lot of input and, and insights kind of baked into that document, and then it's simply executing on that document and rolling it out the door after some testing. Um, it's originally a manufacturing process, and it optimizes for safety. Um, it also is appropriate for very slowly evolving markets, which is why I have an airplane up here. The market for flying doesn't really change that much. I mean, you, ticket prices change, and you know people don't dress up to fly anymore. They used to do that. Um, but flying in the air is a pretty constant thing. It's a set, set of ex engineering uh, solutions that are being applied. You can optimize on them. Um, but for specifically for airlines, the risk reduction part of waterfall is really important because finding a de defect in production means that people could die. So design work is heavily front-loaded into the early stages. Um, so why are we even talking about this? We all know water, waterfall is sort of like, it's almost an insult to call something waterfall in a software organization. You know people are going to wrinkle their noses and be like, oh, this waterfall, that's bad. So why are we talking about it? Uh, because it solves pain. Uh, it turns out that waterfall solves for quite a bit of pain. Um, it solves for uh, engineers know exactly what they're supposed to build. People know, uh, you know they, they have a chance to have conversations and fold everything that they know and expect about this product to be folded into a specification that everybody gets to read. Communication's really easy because you just say, go read the spec. Um, it's really reassuring for stakeholders. Um, it pushes responsibility for failure upstream to the spec doc. So, hey, if we got it wrong, it's the fault of the document. Um, and success depends on the quality of the spec, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself because you can probably understand where this goes wrong. So, yeah, bad waterfall. In, uh, so in modern software, the market moves very quickly. It doesn't matter if you code exactly to the spec. The spec does not equal success if the market has moved. So you need to be able to adjust what you're building to what you're learning because if you write a spec and six months later the market has completely changed, it doesn't matter how well you're doing as far as coding to the spec. Um, the other parts of Waterfall that are bad is that it disenfranchises engineering because you throw it over the wall and, uh, to engineering and engineers receive the spec and they say, this isn't good, I have to build this, I'm going to push back. That's what happens. Um, Estimation is never accurate because the work is way too big. So how do you how do you estimate something when it's just gigantic? <laughs> like you can say this is going to take a long time. How much is a long time? Then you get into really uncomfortable meetings with Gantt charts, and you don't want to be there. Um, I've been there. Uh, deadlines they always get blown. It raises the stakes because um, the whole product fails on the strength of the spec or succeeds. Um, and then there's something. Uh, called a death march that is less common these days, which means that, um, hey, we have a deadline. It's somewhat arbitrary. It's the one you guys gave us. You better finish it by the deadline. And then everyone works nights and weekends for weeks on end and doesn't see their families. And that's, that's the pain. That's the source of the pain. So Waterfall is supposed to solve for all of this stuff in software, but it was never a great fit for software because the software market moves too fast, and it's, it, it's sort of a pretend form of safety. Um, so how do you deal with this if you're working in Waterfall? And I know some of you are, because we all work for, in our careers, large organizations where documentation is a necessary evil. You can't really ever get away from Waterfall completely. I'm sorry to have to tell you that, but it's a thing. So what can you do? Um, you can, as a designer, you can help drive upfront definition work. So that means sitting in the same meetings as everyone else, getting a seat at the table. Um, the specification, try treating that as a statement of work versus a contract. A statement of work is how work is delivered, not what work is. So you sort of start assuming that it's a little bit more flexibility, that it offers a little bit more flexibility than it already has. Part of this is asking forgiveness, not permission. 
which you get a little bit more confident about as you go on in your career. <laughs> it's really important to get a little bit comfortable with that now um, because these methodologies will box designers into a corner. So you need to be a little bit creative in how, uh, uh, as far as how you get out of that corner. Um, so you want to try to break the spec into value-driven increments as you design. Um, this means thinking about it as a series of steps that have some sort of value to the market that we're all talking about when the spec gets written. Um, and so you can test it against the market. And this is, this is starting to sound like agile, isn't it? Yeah, that's because it is. Um, work to give the team room to improvise and learn from users. So do not let your organization hide something away from users for a year and a half before anybody sees it. Take it out and have users look at it. Um, you can validate this chunk work. It's a great process. Um, iterate when possible, not always possible. And by iterate, I mean work with your, your engineers and your PMs to say, hey, can we make this change because it's going to help us sell better. They usually listen to that. So that's a few things um, that to make Waterfall more agile. And speaking of agile, let's talk about agile. Um, so agile is, you've, always, you've probably all heard this, a lot of designers have been to agile training at this point. Um, but agile is a set of principles. It's pretty much these principles. And it's, it's simple, right? It's common sense. And it's humane. And it's a reaction against waterfall. So we have individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We have working software over specifications, basically. Um, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. A spec is a contract. Sound familiar? Uh, responding to change over following a plan. This is the anti-waterfall manifesto. Um, there are a lot of agile methodologies, interestingly. It's not just one thing. So you have the principles, and then you have the methodologies. And methodologies have rules and ceremonies and lots of stuff baked into them. Um, so we have Scrum, uh, Scrum, <laughs> Scrum uh, Kanban, XP, Lean, something called Crystal Methods, which I thought was interesting, Pragmatic Programming, <laughs> and Dynamic Systems Development Method, and many, many more. There are a lot of variations. Um, so I'm going to talk about Scrum, because I think um, often designers get trained in Scrum, and teams try to adopt Scrum. So the idea with Agile Scrum is that work happens in small chunks of value that can then be tested and evaluated against the market. Some of the things you might see in Agile Scrum are things like sprints, regular stand-ups. The team organizes the backlog, sizes chunks of work, discusses priority. Um, we have ceremonies, which are prescribed practices. You have a product owner. Generally, this is a kind of product manager. You end your sprint with a demo. You have a retrospective. What can we do better? And then you repeat. It's very prescriptive. Um, so the pain it solves is all the stuff that Waterfall does badly. Um, so it's engineer friendly because the pain of estimation goes away. It's only two weeks, two week chunks, three week chunks, something like that. Uh, testing work with the market means that you can get customer feedback right away, which pro product managers love and the team loves. Team communication is immediate and clear, stand-ups, little, little to no documentation, no more evil spec, um, easy estimation, good team relationships, less time needed for estimation, integration, and testing, and less time needed to test with the market. So great, right? Um, it has some failure modes. It's quite reactive which means that um, it's really hard to maintain a vision. Uh, and maintaining a vision is what designers do. Um, it's uh, quite prescriptive, which is prescriptive in a bad way. Uh, you can get so obsessed with doing it right that you forget what you're doing. Um, you can end up with an incoherent product, which I tend to call barnacles. You have to scrape the barnacles off the product uh, because it's very reactive and it's hard to, to work to a vision. Um, it's really difficult to align, talking about the business, it's very difficult to align Scrum to things like uh, company deadlines, product release cycles, things like that. At my last company, Cisco, which is a giant company, it's like 80,000 people, uh, we had a yearly um, kind of uh, conference where big product releases were announced. And it was yearly, and that was the deadline. And it really didn't matter how your team was run. That was the release, you know, your release deadline was three months before, so you could get all of your collateral out to the salespeople and the marketing people and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it was not, uh, it, we, when we were trying to run Scrum in that, that was interesting. More about that later. Um, too many meetings, 
lots and lots of meetings all the time. Process over people, which is not what Agile is supposed to be. Um, because there's a prescriptive process, it's really ripe for distortion. And here's, a, here's a, an example of that. Um, so this is something called the Scaled Agile Framework for Lean Enterprises. Um, I've seen this used by huge organizations. <laughs> yeah, take a look. It's not good. <laughs> um, I'm not going to pretend to understand it. Uh, it's pretty complicated, and it's far beyond what Agile was supposed to be, if I can editor editorialize for a minute. Um, <laughs> there's something called the Agile Release Train, which is sort of like kind of in the middle. It looks like a train, and that's the Agile part, and everything else is kind of like, it's, it's uh, Agile safely, safely swaddled in pure waterfall. Um, and this is not individuals and interactions over processes and tools at all, but it's still labeled Agile. It's also something that was put out by a consulting firm. Tells you something. All right, it's, a, yeah, it's kind of an Agile turducken. <laughs> it's taking all this stuff and putting it together, and it's kind of, you don't want to eat it. Um, so strategies for designers, what can you do? Um, so what's worked for me and what I recommend is uh, try to do some vision work in parallel to sprint level work at the same time. So you're doing feature level visioning uh, along with sprint level, let's get small pieces of this big project done, and I don't mean incrementally. I mean that you have a vision of an overarching feature that you've validated with customers and you may be even like iterating on as you're working on the smaller stuff. But there's some agreement as to, yes, this is a good direction that we are working to. Um, we will make adjustments as we go along, but this is, this is a vector that we think is heading in the right direction. Um, and you can have big design style meetings and uh, brainstorming and design thinking loaded into that pretty effectively. Um, you want to come up with hypotheses to research and test that are just completely outside uh, any kind of designs, but you can just call up us customers and say, hey, we're thinking about this. Uh, let me ask you some research style non-leading questions about that. And you call several different customers and ask those questions and see what happens. And it kind of helps a lot. <laughs> Uh, in a way that doesn't take any expensive design time. Um, so the feature level work defines the path for the sprint level work, it informs what goes into the backlog, and it informs decisions made during sprint level work. All right. Um, then there's design thinking. Design thinking is something that, it's a methodology that was created by designers, which is pretty awesome. Uh, many people know it as the thing with the post-its, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, because that's what they kind of remember from meetings. We get together in a room and we put post-its on the wall and we arrange them and group them in affinity maps. Maybe people who aren't designers will remember the term affinity map uh, as they go through this. Uh, but it's, uh, it can be a little dangerous for designers to do this sometimes. Um, anyway, so what it really is is this. I'm not going to read it. But it's basically, uh, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with it at this point in your career, you should really go get some training because it's useful. That's it. It's a very common sense approach to design. And it's really easy to share out in your org. Um, so the pain it solves. Isn't it great? Designers are in charge. <laughs> it's so awesome. So design process drives the solution. It involves everyone on the team. Everyone is a stakeholder. Everyone is acting as a designer. Um, it's low stakes. Uh, it's iterative. We're not pushing pixels here. We're coming up with designs really fast and then abandoning them if they don't work out. Everyone aligns to a vision. It exposes all kinds of underlying assumptions. Um, you get to a solution really fast. The customer validation is baked in. Super common sense. Great, right? Um, well, so there's this thing where designers aren't taken seriously. It's a real professional hazard. Um, if design does not connect to business outcomes, we can be seen as entertainers. And it's in our best interest not to be that. And that URL is a real Tumblr that you should go look at. It's all of the ways that design thinking has been illustrated. <laughs> uh, and that was given to me by a very good design thinking trainer. <laughs> she was fully aware that it has this reputation. Um, so, Specifically, design thinking, it may sound or seem silly, overblown, complicated, uh, has that designer mystique. Um, it can be a really hard sell to busy senior people who are hard to schedule because their time is really valuable and you're asking them to sit in a room all day at best or at worst a design sprint, oh my god, a week of work with designers. 
um, it, can, it may not connect well to current engineering and PM process. Um, it might just be really hard sell because you've got this more granular agile process happening. Uh, the value is clear for new products, but what about existing products? How do you go out and um, get some ideas fully baked with customers and bring them back and your product isn't any, in any shape to receive, to receive those ideas? It might be more of a graft than folding them into your current product. How do you, how do you negotiate that? Um, often there isn't enough stewardship when the design thinking session is over. So the designer running the design thinking session will be like, great, we got everybody to talk to each other and we have all these post-its. And it doesn't go anywhere after that. And that's really bad for design. It means that design loses credibility in your org. You don't want that to happen. Um, it, it can be really poorly facilitated. Um, designers are great at designing. They're not necessarily great at facilitation. Facilitation is hard. Um, it's also an area that's heavily exploited by consultants and can be seen as extra stuff that doesn't have any relevance to company day to day. Honestly, I know some really great consultants who are doing this, so it's not really a ding against consultants, but it can be also a bad thing. So how do you make this work? Um, so make sure, number one, that there are trackable outcomes and run with those outcomes. You need to push them. Um, make sure that it's not silly. Try to make it fun, but it's not pure entertainment. We're here to do work. Um, facilitate well and get training. It's worth your while to, to do that. Make sure that any valid or great ideas gain uh, product management or engineering ownership. Get it in their queues as fast as possible. Get it off your plate. It is not design's thing. It is our thing. So it can't live in your computer or your hands. It needs to be out with the team. Um, negotiate a place in the backlog for out outcomes. If some, one of the outcomes of a design thinking session is, oh, this should be really high priority, make that discussion happen with your product managers. Um, do not let the workshop be the end of your involvement. You are not a meeting facilitator. You are somebody who has power in your org and you need to push this along. It's, it's yours, own it. Um, and then understand how other roles do their work so you can make a case for anything that comes out of a session. Great. So, how have I done this? <laughs> so I've worked at Cisco. Um, I ended up at Cisco after an acquisition. I worked there for two years. <coughs> I came out of a, I worked in big companies before that, but I came out of, at this point of a little startup, about 150 people called CloudLock. We were rolled into Cisco in August of 2016. Um, to give you some perspective, uh, Cisco, as I said before, 80,000 people. It's a global company. It grows primarily through acquisitions. So at the point that we were acquired, there had been 150 approximately acquisitions in the life of Cisco. Uh, which means that there's a ton of different cultures and takes on how to do work um, and attitudes and everything. It's an interesting place. Um, so there's Cisco, and then there's security. So that's within Cisco. And then there's cloud security. And I was in cloud security. And I came from CloudLock. There was another company called OpenDNS that was acquired a year before we were. And then there was another company called ScanSafe that was acquired, I think, two years before OpenDNS. Um, and we were all rolled into one org. And these were the methodologies. So CloudLock did kind of sort of did Agile Scrum. Um, OpenDNS and ScanSafe were most comfortable with Waterfall with a few elements of Agile. And this turned out to be the dominant methodology at Cisco um, because there are tons of, as I was saying before, Lots of external deadlines at Cisco. Uh, and Waterfall with some agile-ish stuff is considered the best way to meet those deadlines. So what does some agility mean? Some agile means that we had story points, uh, reprioritization of incremental work, incremental work, not value-driven work, stand-ups, uh, retrospectives, ceremonies, lots of stuff like that, more or less. But it was really Waterfall. <laughs> and this was OK. If you're kind of grafting on new stuff to an existing product, it's OK. If you're doing new stuff, it's not so OK. Um, but in practice, this meant that little change to requirements or commitments based on customer feedback learned uh, happened uh, during in implementation. If, if, the, if the market changed direction, we couldn't. Um, this meant for designers, uh, we couldn't change course if we learned something new. We could only optimize on whatever solution had been spec'd out. When you optimize a bad solution, the solution can fail, which means bad outcomes for the business. This did not become a problem 
until we worked on a new feature that was for a new market that we hadn't done anything with before. Um, so I'm representing this new feature as fireworks because I don't want to talk about what it was exactly, but it was a big deal. And it was supposed to move us into an entirely new market with entirely new and different customers. Um, but the thing about new markets is that you don't know that much about them. And that was us. We didn't know much about this new market as a design team. So we wanted to talk to prospective customers to figure out what to build. And usually, we talked to existing customers when we wanted to build something new, due to you know, which worked out fine, because they were going to use the new thing, too. It didn't work with this. Um, talking to prospects was a new, uh, different thing for us. And remember, this is a B2B product, not a B2C product. So yeah, we couldn't just go to the public. Also, there's IP concerns and things like that. So uh, Cisco didn't want us to talk to prospective customers because it could mess up the sales process. We didn't want it, they didn't want us to show something half-baked or un something we were unsure about to prospective customers. Um, it, could, it, could, it could interfere with closing deals, which is a real concern. Um, so it wasn't a great, it wasn't a popular decision with the design team, um, but we did our best with it. Um, and we warned, you know, dutifully, we warned upper management, hey, this might not be the right thing. We're working with one customer right now who is internal to Cisco because that's the customer that Cisco is allowing us to talk to. So kind of risky. Um, we knew that there was a beta coming up and there would be prospective customers in that beta and we could work with them at that point to see how right we got it. So the beta rolled around. And designers started sitting in meetings with prospective customers. And these meetings were run by product management. And we noticed that the prospects we were meeting with um, didn't seem to be connecting with what we designed and built, which was a problem. So designers started asking questions. And it dawned on us that we'd gotten things extremely wrong. <laughs> that one customer was not typical of the other customers, any of the other customers. <laughs> so we'd built the wrong thing. Um, but the product wasn't completely built yet, so there was time to recover, but it wasn't a great situation. So what did we do? Uh, we fixed it. We flagged everything to upper management and said, hey, we can recover from this. It's better than it going out to the market wrong. And there are reasons why the spec was wrong. And we shouldn't be designing to a spec. We're supposed to be agile, and we weren't agile. And this was accepted after some back and forth. Um, it's a hard conversation no matter what, and we're all trying to do good things here. Um, and it's, this is, there's a lot of pain in software. So uh, we had a really productive way of splitting conversations between design and product management. Product management was sort of taking on the account style conversations with prospective customers and saying, hey, do you like it? Can you like it more? We can train you. You're going to like it and you're going to sign. Uh, and we said, hey, as designers, what's wrong with it? Tell us what you don't like. We're going to work on it. And that way, one person, the PM, wasn't having all of those discussions at once, because that could have been bad. Um, the uh, engineers bought in really hard after some initial thrash. Um, the engineers were like, but we built it. And we said, but we know that it's wrong. Don't you want to fix it? And they said, yes, we do, which was great. So design helped the engineers succeed, which was lovely. Um, and we built the right thing for the market, finally. Um, so an important point to make here is sometimes organizations don't change until there's some pain involved, um, which I don't recommend as a first strike. <laughs> but I've observed it over and over again. Um, you know, it's really hard to march into an organization and say, I know the right thing to do, and if you do it, you're going to succeed, because you're wrong. You don't know what you're going to, you don't know how the org is going to react. The only thing you can do is adjust to uh, some of the, the pain the org is experience, experiencing and help people out. Um, so in this case, we unintentionally let things play out. We wouldn't have if we'd known better, um, but we unintentionally let things play out. It broke. It's the wrong product. The org was very ready to listen once the danger to the new product's success became obvious in the beta. And we learned. And the org was really uh, ready to repeat the approach that we used in the beta, which played into some process discussions, which was a nice outcome. Um, so I'm going to show you a slightly complicated slide. It's an artifact of these discussions. I'm going to talk through it. So uh, we came up with this process. 
And it's just a common sense design process, but it combines lean, agile, and design thinking. It's just common sense. Um, this is a slide I showed to a lot of people in cloud security. We ended up adopting this pretty broadly. There were still some teams doing what I call agile fall, but the power of injecting research in the, in, early in the process was really obvious to everyone. So basically, you have a backlog. It's a series of problems to solve, um, and they are prioritized by what will make the business the most money if we solve it. Um, then there's this first spike, which is pro uh, kind of problem space definition. And this is very much a feature level pro process. It's not something I would recommend for like a small piece of work in a sprint. Um, but you know, we work together, we interview customers and shadow them, we come up with hypotheses, we test them, um, we apply personas, problem statements, user goals, whatever makes sense to explore the problem space and make sure that we're solving for the right thing. Uh, we ideate as a team, we say, what, are we, what do we think is good for a solution? Um, we get to something we can show customers or a prototype or something, and, and this gets higher fidelity as you repeat. Then there's a second spike of testing and what's works and what's confusing, and hey, a failure is a successful experiment, and isn't that great? Let's figure out something better. Given enough uh, kind of structure around this, this is a very good way to work with a legacy org um, if they're ready. Anyway, so that's what worked. Anyway, uh, so wrapping things up. Um, the thing to remember is you got to make room for design in your org. You work the org to get design where it needs to be. Um, use methodologies to your advantage. And help out your coworkers. Get them what they need to make them feel OK about what you're doing. Because everyone is feeling the same pain. And if you can help people out, that's a relationship that will help you push what you need, which is room for design and room to kind of get your value into the organization. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Oh, I also neglected to mention um, my colleague, Madison. You want to stand up? Madison is also hiring <laughs> researchers. <laughs> so anyway, continue. Mm -hmm. I was looking here at um, what you did with so far. So I think it's a little bit more typical of some of the sure. online Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, so Cargurus is great. I'm not saying that just because I'm standing up at Cargurus and I was just hired by Cargurus. I love it. It's great. So the thing at Cargurus is really interesting because engineers have always been really involved in design. Design is a late addition to Cargurus. So when I walked in the door my first day, people were very excited that I was here. But also, the engineers uh, kept asking me questions about UX. And we're so glad that you know, you're here and we're really interested in UX. And I said, that's great. And I realized that they have been doing UX. Um, and I've been begging at past jobs for engineers to do that, honestly, to get involved up front and be involved in the initial discussions and bring ideas and do this. In a way where they're very, and the, the thing that works here is that they are very good at that and they've been hired for that. So it's not a case where you have um, a lot of people that are used to working on the back end of an app um, and not the front end being dragged into discussions. It's people who are involved in those discussions understand how to get to a good experience. They just don't have maybe a lot of UX um, framework around it. It's more of a UI focus. So yeah, that's, that's really what we're starting with here. We have um, one designer who uh, was here when I got here, Alyssa. <laughs> and uh, I'm hiring uh, four more people this year, at least, um, to join the team. Uh, and I'm building out a team that will be able to work within that kind of environment and uh, be very uh, collaborative with engineering. I hope that answers your question. Anybody else? Yeah. I have a follow-up to that. Um, it sounds like you had a really positive experience um, coming into Cargurus and finding that other people were doing research. But if you had kind of a different experience in the past where sometimes you come into a place and there's like a lot of bad habits, sure. how do you handle you know, really encouraging people to you know, have that interest and mm -hmm. you know, place value on research while also kind of coaching them in a different direction? 
Yeah, I mean, any new thing, you can't really stand, you can't stand up in front of an org and say, top down, I will implement this and everyone will get it <laughs> and uh, take it on and do it. And they'll be like, Anne was right. No, that doesn't work. Um, so what's worked for me in the past with research is, uh, <clears throat> research is objective. Um, opinions are not. So if you're getting into a corner where it's kind of a war of opinions, the best thing to do is to say, do we have any research on this? Can we ask customers? Because this seems to be a thing where nobody really has a definitive answer. And it, it de-escalates that situation extremely quickly. Um, and that's worked, that's one tactic. Um, there are other tactics. I think also research is misunderstood at a lot of organizations. Um, I think the research that people are exposed to tends to be an outcome of what that organization values. And sometimes it's swimming upstream a little bit to get broad research in place. But I mean, with anything, you just have to figure out what value you can add right now um, and prove that you're there for a reason and that, you know, oh, okay, what this person has to offer is going to be something that helps the org. Then you, after that trust is built, you can do a lot more. And suddenly it's not, whoops, suddenly it's not such a big deal to do whatever you need to do. I guess I'd ask where else those are being presented. Presented, Like, is there a bottom-up, grassroots, sneaky campaign to talk to people about these things before they get in the room? And can you be their friend and say, oh, by the way, we're finding X. Where the, I find that big meetings like that, there's such a performance space. There's a lot at stake. So people are more likely to say no than yes. And sometimes you have to work the room a little bit before you have the meeting. So there's a Japanese phrase that a friend of mine likes to use, uh, nemawashi, which means essentially seating the meeting. So you, you get people on your side before they're on stage. Yeah, so I would recommend that as a start. Yeah. Um, I think you have to show the value in whatever you're pulling people into a meeting for, um, especially when it's several hours and, uh, you know, it's a big deal to get senior people in a room for that kind of thing. So you need to be taken seriously. Um, I think that certain aspects of design, like designers are fun people. You can get away with a lot in terms of dress. You can dye your hair great colors. You're kind of the funky person in the office. Like, you know, it's a thing. Um, and you have to be kind of careful that you're not just the funky person in the office who's kind of fun to be around and you have a nice life outside of work and it's cool that you get to do creative things. Um, it's kind of like personal branding, I guess. Um, be really careful of being the person who's kind of uh, entertaining the crowd in a meeting like that and putting post-its on the wall and it never goes anywhere. It's bad branding. That's what I mean by entertaining. It's, per it's fine to be entertaining. It's fine to like joke around with your coworkers and have good relationships. That's great. But uh, we're, not, we're not entertainers. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned briefly that one of the downfalls to Agile was uh, a lack of product vision or potential fragmentation of features mm -hmm. and a lack of cohesion. Um, I'm curious if you have any advice to how to handle that, and particularly when building a new product, um, right. based on your experience, also building products mm -hmm. from scratch. Yeah. Um, 
I think it's just important to understand what the process is serving in the org, and I don't have specific suggestions because I don't know what specific thing you're dealing with. Um, but uh, it's one of the things I've found is that sometimes, you know, again, asking, asking forgiveness, not permission, it's fine to pull people aside and say, this is outside of process. You don't say it's outside of process, but you, you pull them aside informally. Hey, friend, I have a question, and we found this stuff. So I wrote up a thing, and this seems to be the way we're going. Can we maybe organize some of our sprints to serve this? And that usually, that approach really works. I like informality as an approach because formality suggests, oh, we got to do it this way or there's going to be some kind of punishment at the end, you know? So just uh, treat your coworkers like people that aren't subject to excessive process demands. <laughs> Pretend and then pull them aside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Hello, thanks for the talk. Thanks. Um, my name is Kim. Um, you were talking a lot about upfront definition work, mm -hmm. and that is like my biggest problem in my organization is getting them to nail down the business goals. Mm -hmm. And then we'll follow up that up with providing a feature set for the for my like MVP for the viable product. Um, and my organization is new to design. Mm -hmm. So what like making room for design? What activities have you had success with in the past where you're able to facilitate getting those answers and getting that upfront definition? Mm -hmm. Do you have a strong product management capability at your org? Okay, they're your friends. They care about this stuff a lot. In fact, I think that product managers and designers care about 90% of the same stuff. It's just a, different in, it's a difference in perspective. Um, and all the stuff that you were just talking about, your product management org is probably dying inside, at least the senior people. <laughs> because if that stuff doesn't exist, they can't do their jobs well, and they're project managers. Yeah. So, and I'm being a little harsh, but this is something that product managers really need to focus on. Um, so I would buddy up with product management and see if they're feeling that pain and if you know anyone in that org that maybe is like, why don't we have goals? Why don't we have X, Y, and Z? I need this to do my job. I'm having anxiety, <laughs> you know, because how do they measure success? And sometimes it's just like, hey guys, how are we measuring success? Are we measuring success? What do we, what do we mean by successful? How is this affecting the business? I wanna know because it helps me be a better designer. There's all kinds of ways you can attack that. Understanding how product management works is an under, I think, underserved thing in design. Um, and I'm, I was lucky enough to, lucky enough, I kinda hated it, but I was head of product at an organization that desperately needed it because I couldn't get UX done otherwise. Um, and uh, I'd never wanna be a product manager again. <laughs> I love design, but uh, it was really useful in that I lived that experience and I know product manager pain and it's really easy to turn product management methodology and kind of practice to your own ends as a designer when you're working with product management. It's worth figuring that out. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's sort of a strategy that's worked for me. Is that it? All right. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tamara. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of um, sphere of influence and where the designer is fitting in the product manager. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna start with that. Yeah, um, so product managers, they're the thing, and I'm sure I'm gonna make some of the product managers in this room wince, and when my colleagues listen to the recording, they're probably gonna throw things at me, but product managers mostly care about making the company money. Um, they care about prioritizing stuff in an order where the company will make the most money. That's what, they, that's what they're measured by, if the org is a good org. <laughs> uh, anyway. 
uh, the project manager cares if the, if the work gets done. There's a shade of difference there. So a product manager is going to care about markets. They're going to care about, does the customer like this? Um, can I sell this? Can I work with sales to sell this? What are my obstacles? What do I need to do to prioritize work to get past these obstacles? Project manager is like, I need this work done. There's a deadline. Can we get it done? I'm going to remove obstacles for the team to make this work happen. Slightly different. Um, as far as sphere of influence, um, designers and product managers are sort of two halves of the same coin. And sphere of influence will vary by org. Um, and it really depends on how senior the design leadership is for UX in a given org. So if you have a leader who is, um, and this is a thing because I think UX gets grafted onto organizations after they spin up. There's less opportunity for UX people to become executives and talk to executives and have that kind of mindset. Um, so I think that kind of handicaps design traditionally uh, within any software org. They're just not, they, they're not trained to be that way. Um, so I think it partly depends on how senior your leadership really is in the organization. I think it depends on what the attitude is of designers. Are they there to be creatives who kind of execute on ideas? Or are they, which is fine, um, or are they there to do product definition alongside the product manager um, and alongside the engineer? Um, and is it an organization where engineers do that? It really depends. There's a lot of moving parts, but I think it varies. Anybody else? Is that it? I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs>